Hi everybody. We're going to take a look at doing the uh, substitution and review packet. Um, great review for the upcoming test. Problem number one. This is chapter seven, assignment eighteen of review packet. Um, let's keep below that. Okay, chapter 7, assignment 18, says use the fundamental theorem of calculus and your calculator to estimate f of 2 given f of 0 is 1 and f prime of x equals sine of x squared. Um, really, 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 you really, really need to know that f of 2 minus f of 0 equals the integral from 0 to 2 of big f prime of x dx or the integral from 0 to 2, in this case, of sine of x squared dx. Please note it says you're supposed to use your calculator, so don't try and do that by hand. Also, notice over here, we're looking for f of 2, so we need to add f of 0 to both sides of this equation. So f of 2 is going to be the integral from 0 to 2 of sine of x squared dx plus f of 0. Make sure your calculator is set in radians when you do that. Okay, 2. A log begins to lose weight after it is cut due to drying. <clears throat> if the integral from 0 to 100 of w of t dt represents the total weight lost. So I integrated something and got total weight lost. That means I must be integrating a rate. Just like integrating velocity tells us how far we've traveled, so too integrating this weight loss rate will tell us how many pounds we've lost. So what does WT represent? It represents pounds per day, the rate at which the log loses weight in pounds per day. It's a rate function. Be sure to include your units in the description, pounds per day. Um, okay, three. <clears throat> three says, um, sketch this. Okay, so let's sketch this. We've got x equals zero, y equals ten, and y equals three x and we want the region bounded by these three lines. Okay. Um, says first set up an integral to represent the area of the region. Uh, evaluate the integral as an exact value. Do not use your calculator. Confirm the answer with geometry. Okay. So with geometry we see a triangle. We know the height is 10 because this is y equals 10. And we know this length well, that's where 10 intersects 3x, so x equals 10 thirds. So I know that this is the ordered pair 10 thirds comma 10. Okay, so this distance then is 10 thirds. So with geometry, 1 half base times height gives me 50 over 3 as my value. Okay, so next, they say set up an integral. Well, this is top minus bottom. Top minus bottom. Top minus bottom. Top minus bottom. Our top function is y equals 10. Our bottom function is 3x. And I'm integrating from here to here. So from 0 to 10 thirds. The antiderivative here would be 10x minus 3x squared over 2. 
from 0 to 10 thirds. So I've got 10 times 10 thirds minus 3 times 10 thirds squared over 2. Minus, plugging in zeros just gives me 0. So I have 100 thirds minus 100 over 9, the 3's cancel, I have 100 over 6. So if I make a common denominator, I get 200 over 6 minus 100 over 6, which is 100 over 6 or 50 over 3, the same answer that I get with geometry. Okay, 4. No calculator. The graph of the differential function f of x is shown above uh, on negative 3 to 5, horizontal tangent at x equals 6. Let g of x be defined in this interesting and curious way. g of x is 5 plus the integral from 6 to x of f of t dt. Notice we're not integrating from the left side of the picture. It's not from negative 3 to x. It's from 6 to x. Okay, part A. Find g of 6. Well, g of 6 will be 5 plus the integral from 6 to 6 of f of t dt. Well, that's integral from 6 to 6 is 0, so 5 plus 0 is 5. Then we need g prime of 6. g prime of 6. Well, in order to take this relationship and get a g prime out of it, I need to take the derivative of both sides of this equation. So if I take the derivative here, I'm going to get g prime. But if I take the derivative here, the derivative of 5 is 0. And then the derivative of this integral will be f of x. So g of 6 will equal f of 6. And f of 6, I can read off the graph as 3. Finally, g double prime of 6. Well, that's the slope at x equals 6 on g prime equals f. So if I look at the picture at x equals 6, f equals g prime, the slope here, they tell me, as a horizontal tangent. So I know the slope at 6 to be 0. So g double prime of 6 is 0. b. On what intervals is g decreasing? Well, I know that g prime equals f. And g would be decreasing when g prime equals f is less than 0. And that happens on the interval from negative 3 to 0, union 12 to 15. C. On what intervals is g concave down? Well, <clears throat> g would be concave down, and g prime was decreasing. So I want to know when f is decreasing f is decreasing from 6 to 6 uh, from 6 to 15 so 6 to 15 justify your answer oh i need to provide justifications so my justification here is um, g is decreasing on negative 3 to 0 union 12 to 15 because g prime equals f is less than 0 on those intervals. And the justification for c, g is concave down on 6 to 15 because g prime equals f is decreasing on 6 to 15. Okay, 
Um, that's parts A, B, and C. And what about D? Trap approximation for the integral from negative 3 to 15. Okay, using six subintervals as suggested by the graph. Well, here we have a consistent subinterval with delta x equals 3, so we can use the shortcut. And the shortcut, remember, 1 half the subinterval with uh, 3 times 1 of the first height, which is negative 1, plus 2 of the second height, which is 0, plus 2 of the third height, which is 1, plus 2 of the fourth height, which is 3, plus 2 of the fifth height, which is 1, plus 2 of the sixth height, which is 0, plus 1 of the last height, which is negative 1. So that would be my answer to uh, the trapezoid approximation. Just out of curiosity, that's going to be 10, minus 2 is 8, 24 over 2 is 12. So I get an approximation of 12. Okay, 5. By the way, problem number 4 is a great AP free response question. They would uh, give you 15 minutes to do that problem. 5. 5 looks very similar. It also looks like a free response question. No calculator. Consider the differential equation dy dx equals 3 minus x over y. Let y be a particular solution to the given differential equation on 1 to 5, such that y equals negative 2 is tangent to the graph of f. Find the x-coordinate of the point of tangency. Determine whether f has a local min, max, or neither at this point. Justify your answer. Okay, so they're not asking me to solve this differential equation yet. They want me to find the x-coordinate of the point of tangency. Well, let's look at the point of tan the tangent line for a minute. This tangent line is a horizontal line, and we know that horizontal lines have a slope of 0, which means our derivative d of f, uh, the derivative of our function uh, called dy dx, should be equal to 0. So 3 minus x over y should be equal to 0. Well, if I multiply both sides by y, I get 0 equals 3 minus x or x equals 3. So there's the x-coordinate of the point of tangency. I know then 3, negative 2 is this point on f where the slope of f is 0. But they ask then, do we have a min, a max, or neither at this point? Well, if I have a slope of 0 and I'm concave up, I have a minimum. If I have a slope of 0 and I'm concave down, I have a maximum. But I could also have a slope of 0 and be neither minimum nor maximum. So I need to do one of two things. Somehow do the first derivative test and check on either side, but wait, I have to plug in both x and y values. Or this is exactly how I'm going to be using the second second derivative test. Remember. With the second second derivative test, you need to know when, what the, when the first derivative equals 0 and if the second derivative is positive, that's a minimum. And if you know the first derivative equals 0 and the second derivative is less than 0, then you have a maximum. And if you have second derivative equal to 0, you have this case here, which is neither a min nor a max. So in order to figure this out, we need to determine the value of the second derivative at this point of 3, negative 2. So we need to take the second derivative, which means quotient rule. The second derivative would be low d high minus high d low. Now the derivative of y with respect to x is called dy dx over low squared. Well, we want to evaluate this at the ordered pair 3, negative 2. We already know the derivative is equal to 0 at 3. And even if I didn't, 
3 minus 3 is 0, 0 times dy dx is 0, all that goes away. So all I need to do is plug this negative 2 in here and in here. So I end up with a negative, a negative 2 over negative 2 squared, which is 1 half. Since my second derivative is positive, I know I'm looking at a minimum at the point 3, negative 2. My justification is this. Since f prime of 3, negative 2 equals 0 and f double prime of 3 negative 2 is greater than 0, there is a min at 3 negative 2 on f. Okay, part b. Part b, y equals g of x now is a particular solution to this differential equation negative 2 to 8 with an initial condition, find that. Okay, so now they want me to solve the initial condition problem. dy dx equals 3 minus x over y. I'll do the separation of variables thing. dy equals 3 minus x dx. I'll integrate. I'll get y squared over 2 equals 3x minus x squared over 2. Um, plus c. Let's do it that way. Now we've got our initial condition that g of 6 equals 4. So this is an x value, this is a y value. Let's plug those in to find our c. So we've got 4 squared over 2 equals 3 times 6 minus 6 squared over 2 plus c. 16 over 2 is 8 equals 18 minus 36 divided by 2 is 18 plus c. Looks like c is 8. But we're not done quite yet because we still need to plug the c value back in. y squared over 2 equals 3x minus x squared over 2 plus 8. And we're still not done because note the directions say they want y equals form. So the first thing I'm going to do is multiply absolutely everything by 2 to clear out this fraction. And I'll get y squared equals 6x minus x squared plus 16. And then I need to take the square root. Um, it may be y equals plus or minus square root of negative x squared plus 6x plus 16. Um, and we might think to leave our answer like that. However, let's go back a second and plug in uh, 6, 4 here. Uh, I'm interested to see what happens when I plug in 6, 4. So 4 equals plus or minus square root of negative 6 squared plus 6 times 6 plus 8. Um, so 6 squared is 36. Here's another 36. They're opposite signs. And I'm getting 4 equals plus or minus root 8, and that's not true. So I think there's a mistake somewhere here. So I'm going to go back to this line here. y squared over 2, good. 3x, good, negative, x squared over 2, good, plus c. That seems good to me. Let's stop here, and now let's solve for y. So I would multiply everything by 2, and I would get y squared equals 6x minus x squared plus 2c. All right, I'm going to plug in my uh, 4, uh, my 6, 4 here. And I get 16 over here, 36 minus 36 plus, and I've got 2c here. So I know that 2c equals 16. Okay, that seems right so far. Um, and that's consistent with, oh, there it was. I copied it down wrong. This is 16. Um, the point I wanted to make was, when I got stuck in that loop, um, was this. Um, 
When I plug the original ordered pair back in, the stuff on the right is supposed to equal positive 4. Well, it's not going to equal positive 4 if I have this plus and minus in front. If I have a minus in front, my answer is going to be negative 4. So I just want that. So my equation then isn't going to be this thing with the plus and minus in front of it. It's going to be that. Okay, so there's number 5. Let's take a look at 6. Ooh, 6. 6 is drawing. Let's bring the camera head down a little bit for this. We call this the zoom feature. Okay. So what are we looking at here? Um, it tells me here that big F prime is little f. Okay. On the graph, f of a represents what? Well, that's easy on little f. Here's a, and so f of a is this height. On little a, f of a represents the y value for height on little f at x equals a. But what about on big F? Well, I need to establish some sort of relationship here. And I know here from the directions that big F prime is little f. So when I see little f of a, that's the same as big F prime of a, which represents at x equals a, the slope. Uh, represents f prime of a or the slope on big F at x equals a. Okay, next. On the graph of little f, the integral represents what? Okay, so from a to b, the integral. So we know that's the area under the curve and which curve under little f from a to b. Well, what about this? What does the integral represent on big F? Well, we all know the fundamental theorem of calculus now. f of b minus f of a equals the integral from a to b of little f dx. So, what does this represent on big F? It represents this, difference in y values. Remember, big F of a is the y value at x equals a on big F. So here's a, and here's big F of a. And here's b, and here's big F of b. And so we want the difference in those y values. This right here is the difference. And so we'd say the change in y values on big F from A to B. Okay. I wasn't sure you could see all that. I may have moved the page, so I'm going to say some of it again. So big F of A is this height, big F of B is this height, big F of B minus big F of A is the difference in their two heights, which is this length here. The difference in their two heights is, or the change in Y values on big F from A to B is uh, what that integral represents on big F. Okay, next we've got the integral divided by b minus a. Well, that's the same as 1 over b minus a times the integral a to b of f of x dx. This, we know, is the average value of little f on a to b.
And so what does that look like on the graph? Well, here we have A to B. And we're looking for the average of all these heights. And what we said is that there exists some point where the area of this rectangle, because of this undercounting and overcounting, would be exactly equal to the area of the, uh, the value of the integral. And this here, this point C, F of C, provides that average value. There's the average value of all those heights, and that's what this is finding, that place where the area of this rectangle would be equal to the area of the integral, also known as the average value of the function on A to B. All right, so what do we have here with this other one? We've got integral from A to B of f of x over B minus A. Well, we said in the last problem, problem number seven, that this integral represented big F of B minus big F of A. And now we're simply dividing that over B minus A. Well, what's that? That's the slope of the secant or average rate of change on big F from A to B. So from A to B, we want the slope of the secant. Any questions about those? Those are great. Just love them. You should go back and do those again until you're really comfortable with them. Okay, matchy matchy time. Slope fields. I'm going to put the camera head back up. Give me a second to reposition it. And that's better. Okay, the first one, uh, y equals 1. y equals 1 is a horizontal line, so I'm looking for something that looks like a bunch of horizontal lines. Well, that's a bunch of horizontal lines. Um, what's wrong with that one? Well, let's think about this for a second. Um, if I were to integrate, I'd be looking at the integral of y dy equals, oh, no, wait, with the assertion that the slope field could represent. So they want me just to know what, what antiderivatives are we looking at. Okay, so I don't know where I'm starting, I just know where I'm ending, so this is 9. And which one is y equals x? Um, this one is the linear one, 10. Which one is a bunch of parabolas? Here's a bunch of parabolas, 11. Which one's the cubic? This is 12. Then we have this 1 over x squared. 1 over x squared. Well, I'm thinking it's a or g. And I'm not sure yet, so I think I'm going to hold off on that and take a look at which of these could be a sine graph. Remember, sine starts at the origin and goes up and then back down. And I notice that E does that, so E is 14. Cosine is B up here, 15, because cosine is starting high and going down. 16 is LN. Well, does this look like an LN graph, or does this look like an LN graph? LN looks like that because, remember, it's got to be the inverse of exponential growth. So I know that this is 16, which means that A has to be 13. That wasn't so bad. We got through all those very quickly. Let's take a look at 17. Find each antiderivative. 17 integral of x square root x squared minus 9 dx. Okay, so u equals x squared minus 9, du over 2 equals x dx. So I can rewrite this as u to the 1 half du over 2, or 1 half 
integral u to the one half du. So I know the antiderivative here would be u to the three halves, so I need a two third in front. So one third u to the three halves. Don't forget to sub back in your u. And so we get one third x squared minus 9 to the 3 halves plus c. Okay, 18. 18 was the exciting problem. Integral 5x cube root 9 minus 4x quantity squared dx. So I'm thinking two things. First, I'm thinking about writing this as 9 minus 4x to the 2 thirds power. Second thing I'm thinking is this is a u sub, where u equals 9 minus 4x, and therefore du over negative 4 equals dx. But what about that? Well, I could pull out the 5, but I'd still have an x. So I need to find some way to get rid of this. Well, let's go to our u definition and solve this equation for x. So I get 4x plus u equals 9. 4x equals 9 minus u. Divide by 4. So where I see x, I can replace x with all this stuff. So I'm going to have 5, bring out this constant, negative 4, integral, 9 minus u over 4 times u to the 2 thirds du. Well, here's another constant I can bring out. And so I'm going to have negative 5 over 16, 9 minus u to the 2 thirds du. Oops. I'm going to distribute this u to the 2 thirds to each of these, and that's going to give me negative 5 sixteenths integral. 9u to the 2 thirds minus u times u to the 2 thirds. That's 3 thirds plus 2 thirds would be u to the 5 thirds du. Now I should be able to integrate these powers uh, or integrate with my power rule. So this is going to be u to the 5 thirds with a 3 fifths in front and a 9 in front. And over here, we're going to have u to the 8 thirds with a 3 eighths in front. So I'm going to distribute this over here. And the 5s would cancel, leaving me negative 27 over 16 u to the 5 thirds. And then I'm going to distribute this over here. And I'm going to have 15 over 128 plus 15 over 128 u to the 8 thirds plus c. And then don't forget at the very end you need to plug in what u was equal to. So negative 27 over 16, 9 minus 4x to the 5 thirds plus 15 over 128, 9 minus 4x to the 8 thirds plus c. Woof! Now there's a college-level problem. 19. 19 says the integral of y to the third, 1 minus 2y to the fourth cubed dy. Well, this is a more reasonable u sub, where we have 1 minus 2y to the fourth as our u. So du will be negative 8y to the third dy. Well, I see a y to the third dy, so I think to get y to the third dy alone, I need to divide both sides by negative 8. So I can rewrite this then as the integral of uh, 1 over u to the third times du over negative 8. Or negative 1 eighth 
integral u to the negative 3 du. Antiderivative of u to the negative 3 oops, uh, is just having a hard time with this little squiggle here. Negative 1 8 times u to the minus 2, but when I take the derivative, there should be a minus 2 in front. There isn't. There must be a minus 2 down here. So I end up with um, 1 over 16 u to the minus 2 plus c, or 1 over 16 times 1 minus 2 y to the fourth squared plus c. Okay, 20. 20 is the integral of 6x squared sine of x to the third dx. Um, and you know, I see this as uh, u equals x to the third, du equals 3x squared dx, du over 3 equals x squared dx. So I can pull out this constant, 6 integral sine of u du over 3. I'll pull out this constant. 6 over 3 is 2. Integral sine u du. So negative 2 cosine, because we're doing antiderivative here, of u plus c, which is negative 2 cosine x to the third plus c for number 20. 21. Twenty-one says the integral 6r squared secant squared r to the third dr. This feels very much like the last problem, um, except it's secant squared here instead of sine. Well, so r to the third equals my u, and 3r squared dr equals du. So we know that r squared dr equals du over 3. I'm going to pull out this constant. I'm going to have secant squared u r squared dr, we said, was du over 3. Don't forget to pull this 3 out. 6 divided by 3 is 2. Integral secant squared u du. That's going to be 2 tangent u plus c, or 2 tangent r to the third plus c. OK, 22. 22 says the integral of cosine squared t sine t dt. Well, my u here is cosine t. I see the cosine function inside the squaring function, and I see most of its derivative out here. du would be negative sine t dt, so negative du is sine t dt, which means I can rewrite this integral as u squared times negative du. I'll pull out this negative. My antiderivative will be u to the third over 3 with a negative in front. And our u value is cosine. Cosine to the third t over 3 plus c. 23. Integral sine x times the sine of cosine x dx. Well, this function is inside of this function. So I'm going with u equals cosine x, du equals negative sine x dx. I don't see any negatives kicking around here, so negative du equals sine x dx, which means this integral can be written as uh, sine x dx is my negative du, and then here we have the sine of u. I'm going to pull this negative out so I don't inadvertently think I'm subtracting. Antiderivative of sine u du would be negative cosine 
u plus c. There was a negative already there. The antiderivative of sine is negative cosine, so negative times negative is positive. Cosine u would be cosine of cosine plus c. Cosine of cosine. Try taking the derivative of that to confirm this was our uh, derivative. So take the derivative of cosine, I get negative sine, leave the inside function alone, times the derivative of the inside function, which is negative sine x, plus the derivative of the constant, which is zero. Negative times negative is positive, and so we end up with sine x times sine of cosine x. See, it works. 23. 24. 24 says the integral of t secant squared t squared dt. Okay, so u equals t squared because I see part of my derivative here. du equals 2t dt. du over 2 equals t dt. So this is the integral of secant squared u du over 2, which will be 1 half tangent u plus c, so 1 half tangent t squared plus c. 25. Ooh, 25 has a star next to it. 25 has a star next to it, and 18 doesn't? That's right, because a lot of people don't see the easy way to do this problem. x squared minus 4x plus 4 to the 3 halves dx. Okay, so factor this. This is x minus 2 squared, right? Because x minus 2 times x minus 2 would boil to be this, raised to the 3 halves power. When I raise a power to a power, what do I do? I multiply them. And so this is going to end up being x minus 2 to the 3rd dx. If you want to do a u sub, I would make x minus 2 my u, so du u equals dx, and so this is the integral of u to the third du, which would be u to the fourth over 4 plus c, or in our problem, since u is x minus 2, we would have x minus 2 to the fourth over 4 plus c. Okay, 26 another problem with a star. Integral tangent squared 3 theta d theta. All right, so tangent squared. <laughs> Look, if you don't do this one as secant squared 3 theta minus 1, because you're using the trig identity, tangent squared theta plus 1 equals secant squared theta, therefore tangent squared theta equals secant squared theta minus 1. Um, I, I don't know, because we've done this one at least twice in class now. So um, I need to rewrite this as this, which is an impossible integral for me, and now very possible integral. Um, so here, integral secant squared 3 theta minus the integral of 1 d theta. Okay, so here uh, I'm going to do a u sub 3 theta. So du over 3 equals d theta. So then this is the integral of secant squared u du over 3 or 1 third tangent 3 theta minus the antiderivative of 1 with respect to theta, plus c. So I end up then with 1 third tangent 3 theta minus theta plus c for number 26. Okay, last page, 27. Ooh, some more matching. Match the slope fields with the differential equations. Okay, so now they've given me the differential equations. They want to know which of these makes which of these maps. Okay, well, 
you know, we, we might remember that this one makes a circle, but we might not. Um, <coughs> we might remember that if we did the antiderivative here, we would end up with a parabola. And this one looks like a shifted parabola. And we might recall that when we integrate y, we end up deriving pert. Um, and that would be this one. Uh, and therefore, this is that. But if I don't know that this is a circle and that this is the parabola, uh, that this is the parabola and that this derives pert, um, then how else can I do this? Well, I can try values. I can pick a point where they all have different values and, uh, and see what happens. Um, trying to find that point could be a little time consuming and tedious. How about, how about negative one, zero? Let's see. If I plug in a negative one here, I should get a slope of zero. I'm sorry, negative one. Let's just plug in negative one for x's. That's what we're going to do. And when we have x's and y's, it'll be negative one, zero. So if I plug in a negative one here, I get positive one half. So where do I see a slope that could be positive one half? Well, here I see a zero slope. Here it looks like an undefined slope. Here it looks like a negative slope. Here it looks like a slope of one half. So this is done. I plug in negative one zero here and I get a zero. Where do I see zero slopes? Well, this could be zero slope. I think this is undefined slope, but if you're not sure, you might want to plug in a separate point, but because zero slope and zero slope, I'm going with 28 here. And then this one. This would be negative one minus zero would be negative one. So I'm looking for a slope of negative one. There's a slope of negative one. This one has an undefined slope, this one has a zero slope, and this one has a positive slope. So I can use the slopes to help me figure this out. Okay, last three problems. Um, these are three more uh, free response type questions. We uh, are given a slope field uh, with the solution 0, 1. We're told dy dx equals xy, and they want us to sketch the curve through 0, 2. So I'm going to sketch a curve through 0, 2. Uh, that's very simple. There's 0, 2. And I'm going to sketch the curve through 0, negative 1. And there's a solution through 0, negative 1. OK, that wasn't a big deal. Um, slope field for the differential equation x plus y is shown. Give me a solution through 0, 1. So 0, 1 go up over here, but we'll come up this way. And negative 3, 0. 1, 2, 3. So I think I'm doing something like that for the other one. Um, if you weren't sure about the 0, 1, how about we try this line here? That's the sort of shape we're making. Okay, But oh, that's not one of our solutions. This is the 1 through 0, 1, and this is the 1 through negative 3, 0. Okay, finally, consider the differential equation, negative x, y squared over 2, with the initial condition on the axes provided, sketch the slope field at the 12 indicated points. All right, so I got to do it. It's all 12. I plug in 0, 0, I get 0. In fact, whenever I plug in an x equal to 0, I'm going to get a 0. And whenever I plug a y equal to 0 in, I'm going to get a 0. Well, that was very nice of them. They made it so that half the points were zeros. Now I just have to figure out the other half of the points. I plug in the point 1, 1. I get 1 times 1 with a negative in front. I get a negative 1 half slope. I plug in 1, 2. 2 squared is 4 times 1 is 4 times negative. Negative 4 over 2 is negative 2. I plug in 2, 1. 2 times 1. So I have negative 2 over 2 or negative 1. 
Well, this was a slope of negative 2, this was a slope of negative 1 half, and so I want something in between those two. And then finally, negative 2, positive 2, that's going to be 4 times 2, negative 8 over 2 is negative 4, so even steeper than that. Okay, and then I plug in negative 1, positive 1. Negative times negative is positive times 1. I get positive 1 half. And then po negative 1, positive 2. I'm going to have 2 squared is 4, divided by 2 is 2, slope of positive 2. And there's my slope field. Okay, next. They want me to write the equation for the tangent line at negative 1. And they've told me the ordered pair already. So what else do I need besides a point in order to write the tangent line? I need a slope. And a synonym for slope in our class is dy dx. So I want to evaluate dy dx at negative 1, 2. So that's going to be negative, a negative 1, 2 squared over 2, and that's 4 over 2, or 2. So the slope is 2 at negative 1, 2 on the tangent line. So y minus 2 equals 2, x minus minus 1 is my tangent line. If you want to tidy that up, you're welcome to and you would have 2x plus 2 plus 2 plus 4 equals y. That would be our tangent line to the antiderivative at the point negative 2, 1. And finally, they want the particular solution to this. So we know that dy dx equals negative xy squared over 2. I'm going to do the separation of variables. So I have dy over y squared equals negative one-half x dx. I'll integrate both sides. It may be useful to write this like this. And then to say, well, that's going to be y to the negative 2 dy equals negative one-half x squared over 2 plus c. This is negative 1 over y equals negative 1 fourth x squared plus c. I'm going to multiply everything by negative, ugh, I don't know what I want to do here. I have to solve for c, and I've got this initial condition, negative 1, 2. Well, why don't we plug in that now and solve for c? So I'm going to have negative 1 half equals negative one-fourth plus c. I'll add one-fourth to both sides. I'll get that c equals negative one-fourth. So at this point, I have... At this point, I have, going back up here, negative one over y equals negative one over four x squared minus one over four. And I need to get this in y equals form. Okay, so I'm going to do two things. One, I'm going to multiply everything by negative because I'm tired of seeing, uh, I'm tired of seeing all these negative signs. And second, I notice a common denominator here, so I'm going to write this as one term. So I'm going to have one over y equals x squared plus one over four. Now, I don't want 1 over y, I want its reciprocal, y over 1. So I'll do the reciprocal over here. And there's my solution. Okie doke, that's all the problems. I hope that helps. But really, you should be really comfortable with this stuff. Or at least comfortable with this stuff. Or at least moving towards being very comfortable with this stuff. Because we've been talking about this stuff for a while. Have a nice day, everyone.